Hi, this is M, and today we're going to talk about eco printing, also sometimes called eco dyeing or eco boiling. And I'm going to go over the four main methods that I used over the year to eco dye my papers. And I want to share some tips and tricks with you. And if you want to know if you want to stick around or not, I made a little outline so that I know the things that I want to go over and I kind of stay on track. So let me give you a preview of that. Uh, we'll talk about the four various methods and some of their variations, some of the important ingredients, some enhancement ideas, some further notes, uses, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to clear my throat, utensils, and some uh, other ideas. So if this sounds something like so you want to learn more about, then let's get started. The first thing I want to uh, mention is that I'm no expert, and there's a lot of people out there that know a whole lot more about this subject than I do. And I first got uh, interested in, in eco-printing well, I won't say I first got interested in it. I first got introduced to eco-printing back when I was doing craft shows. I don't really have time to do them nowadays, but a number of years ago at a craft show there was a gal there, and one of the things that she did was eco-printing. And I thought it was really, really very nice. And so this year I happened to have some extra time and some extra um, plant material early this spring, and I thought, well you know, let me let me see how this works out. And I had thought back to that number of years ago when I had seen that. And so I did a little research about alum and different things to fix the paper and thought, well, let's give it a try. And so that's what this is about, is the journey. I use four methods. There was the stovetop, the oven, the heat press, and the household iron. And I have done, if you check my channel, I have done videos on the heat press and also talking about why I use the heat press and how I came about it because I had had it on hand for a number of years and you'll learn more about that if you go back and watch those videos. And then the household iron I did a number of videos on. So you might look for those on the channel. These I'm going to move now because this was just some pretty to get started uh, as we lead into the video. You will see this particular kind of dahlia used in some of the things I'll show you, and I'll reference this when we, we get there. This is a dahlia here, but it's a different kind of a dahlia. And this turned out orange. This is fuchsia, and this paper here was made with these fuchsias, so you can see how that turned out. It's really quite spectacular actually. So let's move these away and I'll show you the uh, a reveal for these different kinds of results. Okay. Now on to the journey. I categorized these file folders. I'm going to share with you into segments. And this was, and I labeled each one because I had them all organized. The, these were boiled in a pot. And you can see some of these creases here. I used, a, I didn't have any round piping at the time, so I used a paper towel roll and it collapsed in the boiling method because I had twine around it. So that's why these, uh, these creases are here. And when I do it again, I, I've got to get a better pipe or some sort of tubing that's heat resistant to wrap around or do them flat. But this was from the boiling method. This all the way, so we don't have a conflict with our camera. And so you can see this is uh, this is um, marigold, and I've got a lot to go through, so I'm just going to do some highlights. But this was the boil. And, the, and here was uh, I got to show you an honorable mention. This is red leaf lettuce. 
and this is iris. Blue is iris. This was from early spring when I did this boiling. This one, this one was on a blotter paper. This one was on, what was this? It's almost very thin. It's not tissue paper. I don't really know. This was another blotter paper, red leaf lettuce. Some of these I mirrored, so let me put these down further. Okay, I'm going to bring this camera down, so bear with me, we're going to get a little shaking. This is, uh, this is not a high-tech uh, situation here. This is where they've been, uh, been mirrored. Some of these have been mirrored, some of these haven't. Let's see, how was this mirrored? Okay, this was mirrored like this. So these two pieces went together. Because what's interesting is how the front and the back sides of plants press. And you can see, for example, on this one, this one pressed really vivid, but the other side of it didn't. So that's how these two went together. And then these were baked in water. And so I have a big pan, and then I bake them in the water rather than boiling them. And so we'll just flip through some of these real quick. This is uh, uh, Lupin. These are front and back. These were married together. This more Lupin. More Lupin. I was really enamored with the, the way that the lupin went yellow. Coreopsis type flowers always turn this really vivid orange. More lupin. Uh, this is some sort of kind of like a mart. I don't know. It's a. I put it in the mom daisy family. I don't know what it is. Marigold leaves. Excuse me maple leaves, some more of the Coreopsis family. So these were, and this is a, a, a lig Ligulera leaf. That really printed out uh, quite interesting. Here's some more baked in water. These were more leaves. Early season I did a lot of more, more leaves. So there's, uh, I think, well, this is fern. These were ferns, and I don't know. See, I really needed to write all this stuff down. These is the front and the back of dahlia. I also went on a dahlia fetish this year. And I really think they're both very interesting. That's the front, and that's the back. That's Dahlia. Some more leaves. Open. I'm not sure what that was. Or that. And that was, uh, well, fern. And I think in this paper I sprayed the fern with a little bit of some sort of like distress ink or something in a spray bottle. I think I just sprayed the fern and shook the excess off and laid it down on the paper. I think that's why this has some blue in here. I didn't use very, none of these other things that I can think of here I used any artificial color except for that one I think I did. So I'll try to point out if I do something artificially, but otherwise everything I'm showing you is natural. This was uh, in the oven, baked in the oven. Okay, this was also baked in the oven. And these are married, so I'm showing you how they were front to back. One side versus the other. And that was fern. This, this is uh, ink, delusions or something. It's a hot mess, whatever it is. 
but it, it, this is artificial. It's just color. Uh, this was lupin, and I sprayed the lupin. I think this was uh, Delusion's spray, and I sprayed it with some pink and then put it down. Next season I'm going to do it without any sprays, and I'm going to do it in the heat press and see what happens, because these are still all ba uh, baked in the oven in water, so we're still doing stuff in water. This is Cosmos, and more Coreopsis type flowers. These were married, so this, this is the front and the back of the two sides. So you see, here's the back of the, well, let's see, yeah, this is the back, and this was the front. This is Dahlia, front and back. And again, see how ex exciting they are? That's really nice too. That was some sort of, I don't know, marigold, Dahlia. Well, anyway, I better move along. Boiled in water. Or baked in water. These were multi-purpose paper. This is multi-purpose paper. I have a lot of cans and paper on hand, so I think that that's what this was. The other ones I just showed you, I think, were also multi-purpose paper. This uh, was color enhanced with, I think, again, I used some sort of delusion spray ink, and I put it uh, on the fern and then put it down. So again, that's why you're seeing it be a little bit more pronounced. And I really like that technique. It, it doesn't scream out, oh, I've been artificially inked or helped with artificial ink, but uh, it, it imparts a little bit more definition. Ooh, that's really cool. This is the front and the back. And this is... Uh, Lettuce leaf, I know that. And I wish I could remember that was because it prints really good. Hmm, I don't know. There was this this color here, this well, is that artificial or is that I don't know because I was using a lot of iris, so I I think this might be a little spray. I think it might be a little spray, so there might be some artificial coloring on there. Front and back, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's a front and back. Okay. And again, I think there's a little spray here. This was yarrow leaf and Orisha and Lupin, front and back. And then more front and back. The, oh, this was, uh, I think that was uh, Cosmos. And there's the other side of the cosmos hidden underneath that leaf. This is rose and fern. And this is front and back. These are verbena. Verbena really uh, provide vivid color. And you can see the little florets. Hopefully this camera doesn't blur out as much as my other one. I'm trying a different camera today. Uh, somewhere, if you've watched some of my videos, I've, I've made the comment that marigolds really impart a very vivid, rusty grunge color. And that here's a perfect example of marigold florets. That's just 
exceedingly interesting, I think. And there's the, uh, the two sides, the front and the back. Uh, this was a, regur I think, regursia leaf, which works really well, front and back. And now all these ones that I'm showing you now are all, I didn't do any color enhancing. These are all natural. So all these colors that you're seeing are from the actual flowers. And again, this is front and back. And this is pansy. And then, then this is Snapdragon, which I thought was interesting. And then more verbena. Okay, this is maple. And I had some, I don't, this is an artificial color, but I don't know what flowers I had on there. There's something that blued it up. Oh, it must be the cosmos. It's the cosmos. The blue on this side is from the cosmos that was on this side here. Because cosmos kind of goes that blue color. So that's where the blue came from. And this has not been enhanced. This is, uh, well, look at how beautiful. There's more dahlia and iris. These vivid blues are iris. And that was how those are. Okay. This was more rose. And this was some sort of marigold or something. It's, it's not color enhanced, it's real color. I just don't remember which one. This is a coral bell leaf. Yeah. Uh, Lupin. That's how those go together. That's how those go together. Right, so those were all, this obviously is color enhanced. I used a stencil and did some spraying and then put the leaves on top. So I was just playing around there with that. That was what I say, boiled in water. And then these were watercolor paper baked in water. So this is all watercolor paper. The other one was multi-purpose paper that was smooth. This had a smooth texture, the ones I just showed you. These have more of a... Well, that's not... And this is watercolor paper. This watercolor paper. Yeah, except for this one. I don't know if that's... It doesn't feel like watercolor paper. Well, anyway, most of these are watercolor paper. There may be some exceptions. Again, this was baked in water. And I'll flip through these because some of these now you'll be seeing repetitions burn. This was... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice. This was hydrangea cluster. And it really, it was blue hydrangea, but it didn't blue at all. It just kind of blobbed out. It's interesting, but it still blobbed out. These went together like that. More front. Oh, this is kind of pretty. These go like that. One thing I think I learned is I, I'm putting too much on the page. Like this, I'm going to turn it, I don't know I won't. This was more of that fuchsia. But now I've got these kind of leaves infringing upon it. I think it would have been nicer if I would have just left the fuchsia and had less on it. But I was learning, but that was kind of cool. So that was those fuchsia. This is, try to turn it around so you can see. This was 
iris, and they, blue iris, and they impart a very vivid purple color, purplish blue color. So next year I want to try it in the heat press, because in the heat press I think you, well I love the way that this washes, the way that the wash is out, I think the heat press will be more definitive. It will define them more and have a little less of the run. So this is just gives you an example of something that is done in water for a couple of hours versus what you'll see later in the heat press. It's more Ligulara. The blue is from the iris on this side because this was all being put into the oven and water. These were all sandwiched. These were sandwiched together. This was a bundle. This went on together that way. And look at the difference in color. One side went really yellow and the other side went very uh, kind of rusty. And here's some more dahlia. Some more uh, lupin. Look at how cool that is. Some more cosmos. Fern. This was uh, bitten. Fern. And then more uh, Frisia and Cosmos, Iris. These leaves were pretty cool. I think that must have been Dahlia leaf. Okay, so again, more boiled in water, watercolor paper. Excuse my reach. Um, what is this one? This was baked, baked in water or heat press. Oh, I didn't know what I did with this one, so we'll just flip through it real quick. Some leaves. Cosmos, more leaves. This one turned out really cool. More dahlia. This was after the dahlia drops their petals. There's the you know the the bulky center uh, that would eventually go on and do seed if they seed, and uh, really in parts a vivid color. Those are really interesting. These were steamed in the oven. Not if it was doing more notes by by then. Three fifty for two hours. And again, this is feels like more multi, uh, more of the multi-purpose paper, except for this. I think this is copy paper because it feels thin. It's some sort of thinner paper, and the thinner paper I mostly used was copy paper. I'll start flipping through because again, Dahlia. More of the Ligulera. More Dahlia. This had a lot of, uh, I think this had verbena parts and other stuff. This is copy paper. And this is copy paper. Multi-purpose kind of paper. More, more, uh, maple. This was, an, in, in a video where I did a reveal, I talked about a paper that was, what was it called? I keep saying unbinded, unbuffered, unbuffered paper, meaning they don't put the, the ingredients in 
to this paper that they do in other papers where they buffer them. And this is specialty paper, very expensive. And I bought it thinking, well, unbuffered paper, I thought it was going to do really, really well. And uh, it just, this is just an example, it doesn't take any good imprint at all in all the tests where I did buffered paper. So if you've ever heard of, if I'm saying it right, my notes has it correctly, I think it's unbinded, unbuffered. I think it's unbinded. Well, anyway, whatever the term is, um, save yourself the money because, at least in my humble opinion, it doesn't. It's this would be if there's any paper that I used all year that I would say it does not work for eco printing. This is it. Other everything else seemed to at least do something. So some of these are more have more. This is all rows. Cosmos, um, some sort of like blanket flower. All right, now we're moving into the heat press and the iron. This was uh, eco steamed with the heat press. This was part of a larger piece of paper that I ended up cutting down. I just, I don't know, just gorgeous. This was some sort of, it's not, it's not copy paper, but it's some sort of thinner paper. This was also back when um, daylilies were around. This is a hybrid. Uh, now I uh, take that back. I did this in the heat press. And it's what's interesting is these were kind of a reddish white or reddish orangish um, Daylily that went purple. And I think this was an impatient. Same thing here, Daylily. More rows, other side of the rows. Heat press. This has been cut down. From a larger sheet of paper. This was another attempt at hydrangea with the heat press. And a little earlier I showed you the hydrangea in water in the oven. Now see this side. It must have been the back side. Oh, that was the back side. Well, even the back side doesn't look bad. But this is, was actually the side that, that the hydrangea was put on. And it did impart a little bit of blue color. They were blue hydrangeas. So, yeah. Okay. And the hydrangea leaf. More dahlia. And this, I think, is more hydrangea. This is the front and the back. And this was kind of a potpourri. I think that I showed this in another video, but I'm not sure. I think I I think I did did, but just in case. Really nice. Just to show you the front and the back of that flower. How the different sides print differently. More dahlia. Is Simpson a dahlia theme here? <laughs> uh, 
I was wondering if I had a front and a back going on here. Well, here's the front and back. There's the left hand side is the front and the right hand side is the back of the same flower. And there's those things that I told you that after the bud after the petals fall out in part color. Now I have a, a several different kinds of dahlias. That's why you're getting different uh, different results. This dahlia is not the same as this dahlia. They're two different kinds. And okay, and this is, uh, is that our last one. No, oh, no. <laughs> We're getting there. These were, I think these were with the iron. Here's some that I've already cut down for bookmarks. That's some of these, I'm, that's what I'm going to use them for. These were flowers. Most of these were, I, were getting uh, mid to late season, getting into impatience and begonias. This is another spiky flower I don't know the name of. That's the front. This is a, uh, I call it toad flax. But look at how how detailed that flower is. Oh, this is where I just took leaves and flowers and I don't know, paint or I think that's probably acrylic and I was just playing around with imprinting stuff and so that had this is just that's a nothing but not really a subject of today. So I think we're moving into the iron. When I did a video on using the household iron and uh, some of it I, I showed on film, and some of it I didn't. This is Cosmos, that's the front and the, the back. This was the front and the back of a delphinium, a blue delphinium. I just put the whole, whole piece down to see what ha would happen. And this was just kind of a pattern, but I, it's petals and other things, but I don't know what the other things are because I can't really differentiate them. Okay. This Remember that flower I showed you at the beginning of the video? Wherever it went? That's the color that it imparts. It's this really vivid, and you'll see another one that's even more vivid, that orange color. This is more of the fuchsia, uh, yeah, the fuchsia that I had the flower of at the very beginning of the video. These are roses. Those are dahlia petals. Look at how, just taking the petals off the dahlia and not pressing the whole dahlia, how they print really, really nice. Another dahlia. This is just regular paper. Regular paper. Regular paper. Oh, this is a. No, oh, this is a newsprint, a really thin newsprint. Didn't hold up very well. It started falling apart when I washed it. There's another piece of the newsprint. Not my favorite, but it works. 
That's a hot mess. I'm not really sure what that is. <laughs> yeah. Cosmos. Now, this one I just took a bunch of uh, begonia flowers and leaves and threw them down on the paper. And while nothing's really defined, I really like the color scheme. I mean, for a background, where you're, you don't need or want anything to find. I just really, really thought that turned out nice. Some of those yellow flowers. This side really turned out good. More fuchsia and more dahlias. And this is the last pile. And let me take a look at these. Here's uh, this is different kinds of paper in the heat press. This was the final heat pressing that I have done. I haven't done any heat pressing since this. And this is using uh, that larger one that, that I talked about. These are just some strips. The heat press was only 15 by 15, and some of my watercolor paper is 18, and so I had to cut cut the ends off in order to fit it in the heat press, and then I took the ends and then I heat pressed, I put stuff on them and then pressed them, like, you know, some of them I folded and some of them I, I went like that. But that's what these pieces, why these pieces are like that. And I'll probably use these for tags and that kind of thing. So these are just the ends of the larger sheets. Some more of these uh, yellow daisies. Some more of that where I just threw all those begonias and other things down. Mm. Okay, this is uh, uh, some sort of multi purpose paper. More dahlia. I mean, even the back looks nice. And some more leaves. Some more uh, maples. I guess, but guess what this is going to be? More dahlia. Must have been. Well, looks like a freesia. There's some orange. Look at how orange that goes. And now your leaf. Really looks well. That is a really in-your-face orange. All right, we'll start flipping through these quicker. This is that unbuffered or unbinded paper I was telling you about. Another example. You see how this this um, watercolor paper defines. And then this buffer paper, just it just I mean it's it's pretty, don't get me wrong. I would use it for a background. I think it's gorgeous. But it will not take any definition. And this was on a totally different day, totally different method than the one than, than the ones I talked about earlier in this video. This is a cluster of um Coreopsis type flowers. Let's see how vivid they are. 
I mean, really, it's just... I think that's, yeah, that's the front. And then that's the back. This is just some sort of chintzy type of blotter paper. Same here. More Cosmos. More Fuchsia. More begonias just scattered onto the paper. Okay, get through this. I did spray, this is the back side of fuchsia, I did spray this pinkish is from some uh, distress ink, I don't know which one, one of the pinkish ones, in a spray bottle. Just a little tiny misting on the back. There's nothing on the front side. I don't know why I did it that way. I just did some more fuchsia. And more fuchsia. More cosmos and other various things thrown in there, but mostly cosmos. And this is the other side of the same flowers. Here I took, uh, we probably all have some of those pads of, of paper, and I thought, I've got all this paper that I don't like in some of those pads. And I thought, well, what would the backside do? And it didn't do much. I'm going to try it again some more and with some other techniques and see, but it, it, didn't, it didn't take all that well. I still think I like this side better than that. I don't really think of anything I'd use that for, but I would use this as a background for something. This is, it might be a rose. Or an impatience. I'm not sure. This one is probably one of my favorites as far as the uh, fuchsia goes. It just turned out really well. The purple, this is all natural colors. I didn't do anything to it. This is gorgeous. And I did it this way. And here's another one of those big, this is one of those spider dahlias, one, really big blossoms. A lot of water in it. Okay, so now that I've showed you the different methods, and you can kind of formulate your own opinion about, uh, I think they all work. Fine. It just depends on. Uh, now I'm going to talk about just a little. Go over this list and just make some comments. Um, to me, the stove top, you can do it in the water and steam. Steaming, put some rocks or some wood underneath so that your bundle is not sitting in the water, and therefore you can steam them as opposed to boiling them in the water. I find that, generally speaking, and again, this is just from my limited experience that generally speaking, boiling them or baking them in water will cause more wash effects to come away from the flowers. And if you like wash effects for the watercolor type uh, situation, that would be a good method. I don't think there's any right or wrong method. I think it just depends on the look that you're going for and the type of flowers you're using. And it's all a trial and error. It's just generally speaking, I just found that they were a little had a little bit more wash flourishes in the water than in the steam method. So stovetop in water and steam, oven in water and steam, same same principle. Uh, I have a baking pan that I'll show you in a minute when I briefly touch on olives that I that I use for that for the in oven method. Uh, the heat press I've got a number of videos on the heat press. And if I were asked what is my favorite method personally, uh, it would be the heat press. However, I will say that you have to have a bigger chunk of time when you're using the heat press as far as standing there holding it and, and being and attending to it than if you use the stovetop or the oven. 
if you use the stove top or the oven, you can make your bundles, uh, make your stacks, stack up your, your pages, bundle them up, and then put them in the pan or in the oven, walk away for an hour and a half, two hours, and then come back. You might want to check your water level if you're using a stove top so that you don't burn your pan or boil the water out, but, but otherwise than that, it's just put them in there and forget it, whereas the heat pressure, you, you don't ever get that kind of break. So it really just depends on what your timeline is. Uh, but for impressions, uh, for flowers, uh, I'm speaking flowers when I'm talking about the heat press, I find that works really well. And the household iron, that worked a lot better than I expected, and I have a video on that if you're interested. So if you don't have any of these other things, or you just want to think what, what does a particular um, flower do, does it impart any color, just get the iron out and test it. It's really good for testing. You get instant results. Uh, no waiting. Some ideas for use are cards, bookmarks, gift tags, ephemera, journal pages, envelopes, collage, scrapbooking, mixed media, framed art, wrapping paper, backgrounds. So there's all kinds of things that you can do with uh, the results. After I eco-print, I do wash these under the sink to get the remnants of the the plants and leaves off. Uh, enhancement ideas, uh, coffee, tea. I know a lot of people when they're they're boiling it in the pots in the water they'll add uh, rusty items. I haven't personally used any rusty items yet but I'd like to give that a try. Other herbs that you might buy at the store or maybe you have in your garden that you want to put in there. For example, if I was boiling something and I wanted to impart some blue, I'd probably grab some iris or um, maybe some roses that I know go purple. You know, once you know what color things tend towards, you can just um, even use stuff out of your garden and throw it in the water and turn the water a certain color. Inks and art mediums. I showed you where I sprayed a couple of things on some of the papers, although I didn't use many artificial mediums this year. You certainly uh, can play around with that. Other things that uh, that maybe you already know about or you've heard about or you want to test. So that's... Uh, and then uh, some general notes was to... Uh, these eco prints, I'm, a, I, I'm now most of these I haven't noticed any fading or anything like that. But I've been I've kept them in these folders so that I could do this video. Now that I've done this video, I'll start using them. But I would assume just like pressed flowers or any other um, inkjet art or other things like that, or even paints. You know, there's a lot of paints that uh, or inks and paints that are are uh, that will start to fade if you put them in direct sunlight. So I wouldn't put them in, I wouldn't put your, your work in, in direct sunlight or hang one of your prized eco arts a, 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 on the wall and put them in. You could also spray it with a UV non-yellowing protectant and, uh, and that doesn't, uh, you know, take away from, from the prints. And then utensils, of course, or pots, pans, or heat press iron rocks, woods, and tubes. Um, when you, when I was putting my bundles in the pan of water, the bundles want to float, and they also want to float when you're boiling them in a pot. Uh, so you want to have a rock or some other kind of something to metal, heavy metal pieces, wood, to weight them down so they'll stay under the water. Hot pads and tongs, of course, that, that, to get your, your bundles out of the water and because it's going to be hot. And then if you are going to steam in a pan in the oven, you're going to want some aluminum foil. You're going to want to put some wood or some rocks at the bottom of the pan to, so that you can have water down there, but your bundle stays above the water level. And then you're going to want to cover it with aluminum foil like you're baking a turkey or something. So that would be for the, the oven steaming method and spray bottles and sponges for uh, applying different things if you want to do that. And then, okay, now we're going to go on. The final subject I'm going to talk about is important ingredients. Alum, or other mordant, uh, to prep your paper. And I use, uh, let me bring over some visions here. Okay, here's the pan that I was talking about that I use for uh, putting my bundles in in the oven. 
it's just deep enough that I can, you know, do a bundle about like that. And if I steam them, I've got enough room to, to raise them up. And if I, if I break them in the water, there's an, enough depth that I can cover them. Here's, all, here's some alum. This was uh, Jacquard alum sulfate. And they say dissolve a quarter cup alum in one gallon of warm water. Or for paper marbling, a quarter cup of alum in one quart of water. So it's just, this is just granulated. I do want to make a note about alum, and that is that it is kind of a salt. I personally am not sensitive to alum, and in my men's, men's wet shaving business, I actually sell alum blocks for men after they shave to put to rub the alum block on their face. Now, you don't leave it on your face um, because salt is like a salt. It is kind of drying, so you want to put it on because it has mild antiseptic properties and then rinse it off. That's what it's for. It's kind of like an antiseptic after you shave. At least that's what the intent is for the men's wet shaving side of things. Um, and then, of course, for what we're talking about here, it's a mordant to help. Um, it, it's a mordant to help draw the color out of your flowers and leaves and impart them on the paper. There's other mordants around, so be sure to research that. But I use all of them. It's it's simple. It, it's fast. It's it's easy to find. And I'm not worried about it being caustic, so I don't wear gloves. But if you're really, really sensitive or you're worried about it, well, you know, certainly wear gloves if you're, if you're uh, concerned. I have a lot of spray bottles because I've been doing a lot of, I, with the, I did the iron and with the heat press. And so what I do with these is uh, when I lay my stuff down, because with the iron and the heat press, the papers start to dry out fast. So you always have to kind of... Um, mist them to keep them moist and so if you watch those videos you'll see me using these bottles all this is all in water again I just uh, I just take my recipe I generally use about one heaping teaspoon to a cup of water um, but this is all in water that I always have handy and then this is vinegar water and it's about a I don't know I think I've I think I've settled on about a 25 to 30 percent solution of vinegar and then the rest of water and again I spray when I'm doing the uh, the um, the heat press or iron if I'm doing it in the in the water method where I've got my bundle sitting in the water in the pot or the pan I'll put about a cup of vinegar to a gallon of water I also have this is alum water in here because when I'm getting my paper wet if if I haven't almed, if I haven't pre almed my paper, which this bundle here, everything in this, everything in here has been pre almed, and what I mean by that is I put all the water in this pan, and then I actually dipped the paper in the pan, rolled it, and got it totally wet on both sides, let it drip for a few minutes, and then set it on some opened cardboard, card you know, recycled cardboard boxes that I opened up so they lay flat on the floor. And so I set all these on the, the cardboard, which is generally on my floor because that's where I have more room, and then they're left to dry so that these are always at the ready. So that's what these are. These are pre alum pieces of paper that have alum on both sides. I've got a couple pieces of fabric here. Here's some rice paper that, I, that I've alumed. So these are pre alum by dipping in the pan. But sometimes when I'm doing heat press or I'm using the iron, I haven't pre almond my paper, so I'll grab a piece of paper and then I will take the sponge and open this up and then I'll get the sponge wet and then I'll write this along the paper and wet it that way. And, and, that, and then it's almost immediately ready to, to uh, start using. So I keep this handy. We already talked about the vinegar, the alum. I do keep a bottle of water handy just, just for when I need to add a little bit more moisture, but I think that I've already done sufficient aluming and vinegaring. This is coffee. Uh, sometimes when I just want to impart a little bit of a antique or vintage look uh, and or have a little trace tannins from the coffee to help uh, impart more color, I will use the coffee water. These are primarily the things that I'm using. And there's a lot more things that you can use. Okay. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, did I talk about additional resources? Well, if I did, then forgive me because I'm going to do it again. For additional resources, there are ebooks out there from people that have a lot more 
knowledge and and uh, have been doing this a lot longer than I have so be sure to check those out uh, videos YouTube and and other sources for videos there's a lot of people sharing what they've learned about eco printing so please do that blog posts trial and error testing and others I think I did talk about this at the beginning of the video but it's a good way to wrap things up so hopefully uh, that's it. Thank you for hanging in there, and you have a wonderful day.